On episode 371 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Marla Heller and discuss her book, The Dash Diet Mediterranean Solution. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 371. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Our guest today has been instrumental in bringing the DASH diet from the lab to your kitchen. Uh, she is a registered dietitian and holds a master's of science in human nutrition and dietetics. She's also worked and completed uh, her doctoral coursework for public health. Uh, the book we're going to talk about today is called The DASH Diet Mediterranean Solution. With no further ado, here's Marla Heller. Marla, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you. I'm really glad to join you. Yeah, I have to say, I, I've seen study after study after study, and uh, it's it's always interesting to me. Th th there's certain diets that always end up kind of at the top of the list, and you know, I, I think I first uh, heard about the Mediterranean diet probably I don't know 15 years ago or better. It's been a long, long time. People have been talking about about that diet. Um, and then the DASH diet is something that's a little bit newer, and, and there are a lot of similarities, similarities between the two of them, but I, I have to be honest with you, I, I never really deep-dived into either of them, and, and I, what I found with your book was I, I had a lot of general misconceptions about what they actually were. Interesting. Tell me about those. Well, okay. When I think Mediterranean, I, I don't know why, but uh, my thoughts always go to Italy. And, and Italy is one of the countries that would fit, fit that concept. But I just think, wow, you know, and all that pasta and pizza. And, you know, I'm like, I, there's, I mean, there's no way I can eat like that. You know, I, I've, I've eaten pasta before and, you know, I was younger. That's pretty much how I put on my weight. And I think, you know, so if I'm going to eat, you know, like the French and like the Italians, other than the fact that I know, having been over there, the quality of their food is, is a lot better than what's available here sometimes. I just thought, okay, I, I'm not going to eat bread. I'm not going to eat the pasta. You know, that's the white foods that pretty much I need to stay away from. Uh, so and that is a very common misconception that um, it's all about having platefuls of pasta and lots of bread at the table. And actually, that's not the basis of the Mediterranean diet, that's kind of a more Americanized idea of what it is. And I will also mention that, that it's kind of where people get off track with the Mediterranean diet because it's not absolutely defined. So people kind of take their own interpretation. And as you say, they may get really off track with that. Yeah. And, and so I think that's why I never really dove into those and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I mean, what I, what I sort of took out of it from my part was I said, okay, I, I know that, I know that they don't do as much GMO. They don't do as much of this other stuff over there. They have access to local produce because they, they grow it there. And so I was thinking more in terms of they're eating higher quality foods and I can sit there and put someone on a high quality carnivore diet and a low quality carnivore diet. And you're going to see a difference in their health just based on the quality of the food, but, but kind of getting into your book, I, I really, like I said, it opened my eyes to uh, some, some depth that's there that you, you it's, and, and, I, and one thing, another thing I really liked about the book was that you go with this approach of don't tell me what I can't eat. Let's, let's just focus on what we can. And if we're filling ourselves and getting the nutrients we need from the foods we can, we're going to be so much better off. What a concept that you should enjoy how you're eating. <laughs> and it can still be healthy. So, yes, yeah, yes, that's absolutely something. If people can't enjoy what they're eating, they'll never be able to stick with a healthy plan. And that was actually one of the things that motivated me to, um, this is my second career, and it motivated me to go back to school and become a dietitian. I was working with people who were having heart attacks at relatively young ages, including in their mid-30s. And 
after they had the heart attack, they went on just living the way they lived because they didn't think that eating in a healthy way would be satisfying enough that they could really enjoy their lives and they still wanted to enjoy life. And I knew from watching people in Europe, because I was traveling a lot in Europe, that they enjoyed how they were eating, but they were still taking care of their health. And I thought somebody needs to bring that where you show people you can enjoy eating and be healthy at the same time. Yeah, I think that's where kind of, like I said, my disconnect with those as, as diets were kind of along the lines of, of just really misconceptions. And so I, I'm really happy to have an opportunity to have this conversation with you. Could you take just a moment and, and kind of go through what the DASH diet is, uh, how it came about, what it, what it includes, and then kind of go about the same thing with the Mediterranean diet? Well, the DASH diet was originally developed by people who were working on different kinds of approaches to help people lower their blood pressure without medication, because they knew that some people who ate in particular ways, had lower blood pressure naturally. And one of those ways was um, being a vegetarian. They saw that people who were Seventh-day Adventists who are primarily vegetarian had significantly lower blood pressure than most Americans. And they're eating from the same food supply. You know, there's nothing different. They have the same kind of lifestyle, so forth. But the vegetarian diet seemed to be very helpful for lowering blood blood pressure. However, they didn't think that most Americans would actually go along with that because we are a country of meat eaters. So they wanted to take the best parts of a vegetarian diet and create one that was more flexible. And first of all, I must say people can still be a vegetarian and follow the DASH diet because it really does emphasize lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts, beans, and seeds, um, it includes things like mostly whole grains, but not overdoing them, and lean meats, fish, and poultry, if you choose to include those in your diet, along with the heart-healthy fats. So this is something vegetarian or not vegetarian. It's something that people can really fit into their lives. And when they did the first research, they saw that people did lower their blood pressure as much as the first-line medications would do. And it did this in just 14 days. And in fact, I've seen people who um, I have support groups on Facebook who are following this book. And people are seeing their blood pressure drop in as little as seven days. So that's very, very impressive. And it, is, um, it is, but it's also kind of one of the things that, uh, and you do caution folks about this. If, if you're on uh, blood pressure lowering meds and you decide to change the way you're going to eat, have a conversation with your doctor because that might be a, a moment when your doctor needs to know you're doing this and you may, be able, may need to be able to call in to him or her and say, hey, doc, um, I'm checking my blood pressure each day. It's, it's just falling off a cliff here. What do I do? And they'll help you taper down your meds the way that you need to. So, but, so it's really good exactly. to have food. And, and you even say, you say in the book, uh, you know, it, it's not so much that food is the medicine, but food sets the platform for us to get healthy if we're, if we're putting the right foods in our body. And that is one thing when they go around the world and they look at places where people li live exceptionally long and stay healthy that whole time, they found that they tend to have these similar ways of eating that are really strong on the plant-based foods, but you can also still have some of the fish and meat and lean poultry and so forth. So that is, um, something that we really do want to emphasize that you can stay healthy your entire life. <laughs> Good. Now, so that's the DASH diet. So what is the Mediterranean diet and, and how is it a little different? Well, the Mediterranean diet, um, the things that are really beneficial are much like DASH, the vegetables, the fruit, heart healthy fats, which would include things like um, from cold water fish, you get the fatty um, acids that are the fish oil things that actually help to um, improve your heart health. And they also include olive oil all around the Mediterranean. And it's not just in Italy and Greece. All around that Mediterranean, olive oil has been the basis of their diets. That's what they use. And 
One of the things, again, that you, we talked about earlier is that people tend to get off track and think it's all about having lots of pasta and lots of bread and it's white bread and so forth. But it's really those vegetables that make the heart of the, of the uh, Mediterranean diet. So that's something that's kind of interesting. Um, in fact, they've even found that some of the islands in Greece and Italy where they were studying and saw that they did tend to have a lot of people who lived to be over 100 and were still very physically active and socially active. They were eating lots of different types of greens and they would actually go out in their fields and collect some things for making a salad and so forth. And they think that that may have been one of the advantages. So having a variety of greens can be a really good thing, hidden benefit. And also the red wine seems to be pretty much protective as well. And it's not something that people have to go out and start drinking red wine. It is really high in antioxidants, but there are also a lot of other fruits and vegetables that are very high in antioxidants. So if you do drink wine, a little bit of red wine with dinner is a really great thing, but we're not encouraging people to start. I mean, but you do want to make sure you're getting enough fruits in your diet as well. So those are some of the hidden things in the Mediterranean diet that most Americans aren't aware of. And it's probably one of the reasons why, you know, some people may try to follow a little bit of a Mediterranean diet and then it doesn't feel like they're getting a lot of benefits. So I think it helps to really focus on the core foods that are really going to be making you healthier, which would include things like fruits and vegetables, um, mostly whole grains, lean meats fish, poultry. And again, that's the same thing as in the Dastok diet. And in the Mediterranean diet, they also have a lot of nuts, seeds, and beans as well. So the vegetable proteins are also really um, helpful for keeping people healthier on a long term. Okay. Now, you, you mash these up to come up with the, the, the Mediterranean DASH diet program. Um, one of the things that I saw in there that you know, I have to say was a little surprising was that milk, uh, dairy, kind of plays a, a fairly big role in this. And actually, in the first DASH study, they did one group where they didn't give them extra milk and dairy, and they did not see as much blood pressure benefit as the people did who were including a little bit of extra dairy. And with a Mediterranean diet, when they have dairy, it tends to be fermented, such as with yogurt or um, cheese. And all around the Mediterranean, you're going to see people using yogurt as a basis for sauces, for salads, and so forth. That is something they include a lot of. So there, um, there's a little bit of shift in how you might do more of a Mediterranean-oriented dash but it's certainly super delicious. Yes. So that's a good thing to do. <laughs> it is. Okay. So so basically what we're saying here is now you kind of put these all together and the you know the basis of it, like you said, is going to be fruits and vegetables. The bread that you eat is going to be whole grains. And um, one of the, the dangerous myths that you have in the book is that it's it's not 12 servings per day. Uh, <laughs> that was something that actually came out in the um, late 80s in the United States. They recommended that people have between 6 and 12 servings a day of bread or, or some kind of grain food. And that is a lot. And that was precisely at the time when people were becoming much less active in their lives. So we ended up with this epidemic of obesity based on these food guidelines of eating lots of grain and cut back on the amount of protein foods that you eat. And actually, the one thing that we're not getting enough of, and especially as we get a little bit older, is the protein-rich foods. You need that to maintain muscle because the more muscle you have as you age, the younger your body is. Yeah. And so, you know, like, and we're going to get some of the protein from the vegetables. That's one of the things that I've, you know, really been looking into lately is if you're eating leafy greens, there, there's, there's protein in there. Now your body's got to get what it, the other essentials that it's not getting from that. And it'll get those from other food sources. So you can include lean meats in there with this. You're going to get some uh, protein from the 
dairy that you're going to be eating. Like you said, for the most part, uh, it's going to be fermented. If you're getting it cold water fish, you're going to get fish oil and then also adding the olive oil, which I think, you know, most people know if they're getting good quality olive oil, they, they are getting the, the right things their body needs. And so you put those all together and now here's this, this med dash program, but we kind of started down the road of talking about these dangerous myths and, and, and you know, one, yeah, the 12 servings of, of grains, which I, I basically, I, I think uh, Kellogg's or General Mill just drafted that one and said, here, shove this one in here. Let's make this the base of the pyramid. Uh, <laughs> it was actually based on, they saw people in some primitive areas whose blood pressure um, stayed at a normal level, even as they got older and they stayed healthy that whole time. And they thought that that was part of the reason is because they were eating all these grains. Well, most Americans aren't doing a lot of whole grains and they also, they stayed healthy because they were very physically active and they were not eating huge amounts of calories. So combining easy access to food in lots of quantity, that turned out to be a really bad combination to have those recommended six to 12 servings of grain every day. So that, that was really off track. <laughs> well, there were, there were others in there. Can you, can you go through a few of, I guess, for lack of a better word, favorite uh, nutrition myths uh, that, were, that are out there? And I, I have a couple I'll probably follow up with as well. Okay. Well, one thing is that if people are thinking about losing weight, and at this time of year, people are thinking about, okay, I ate too much during the holidays, and I want to lose a little bit of weight. They think that the weight loss itself is the goal, and it really is not. You want to lose fat, but you don't want to lose muscle, because if you lose muscle, you slow down your metabolism, and it also can make you feel a little bit weaker. You actually want to focus on losing fat. And that's one of the focuses that has been off uh, track. And actually, having a diet that's high in those grains will tend to, as we get older, and if we're not too physically active, it will tend to build fat. So the grains are actually, they get broken down in digestion to sugar. And that sugar that we don't need for our activity gets stored around our belly, especially as we start going over the age of 40 or so. Yeah. So that can really get people off track. And we'd like to focus in, you'd like to get rid of that excess belly fat, especially because that seems to be associated with a whole lot of diseases, but you want to maintain muscle. So that kind of helps you define what kind of foods you're going to eat. Absolutely. So and another thing that we've all been way um, off track on is thinking that if you just cut calories and you're a little bit more active, you're automatically going to lose weight. And if people are in an ideal situation, for example, they have places where people can go in to lose weight and they're kind of trapped in a location and they're very limited in how much they can eat and then they do watch what they're eating. But most of us are free living, free range people, and we can go around and do whatever we want to. So it's really helps to think about there are certain kinds of foods that actually will help us burn a little bit more calories. So they have recently found out although I guess some researchers knew earlier that when you're digesting proteins, it takes a little bit more calories to actually digest it. So you don't get quite the same impact in terms of increasing your weight if you're having enough of the protein foods as compared to if you're having a really high starch or high sugar diet. So that's a really... Um, helpful thing for people to know. And that was one of the things that was off track in the, let's say in the 90s, where as a dietitian, we were trained to cut calories proportionally across fats, starchy, sugary foods, and the protein foods. And actually, you want to cut the starchy, sugary foods and maintain the protein-rich foods and the heart-healthy fats because they actually help to quench your hunger. And the protein helps to keep you feeling full longer. So they really weren't focusing in on 
how do people work in a real life situation where they're trying to moderate their food intake and to have it be something that they can actually sustain in the long run? So they would get off track by, um, they would not feel that they're being successful in the diet. So they said, well, we might as well go back to the way I was eating because this isn't working. So, yeah, and, and I agree. I, you know, I've, I've seen that. And I guess what I'd like to say is, is my thoughts on that one is that technically, yes, we, we are going to expend calories. And if we're not getting enough food, uh, our, our bodies will begin to burn fat for that excess energy. But our bodies are really, really uh, designed well to make sure that we don't starve to death. So what's going to end up happening is your body's going to sit there and say, well, you know, you're, um, you're not eating enough, so we're going to start cutting off certain processes that we don't need as much. So we're not going to produce as much of this uh, enzyme, and we're not going to make as much of that hormone, and we're going to start cutting out systems that don't keep us alive. And so your, your, your metabolism actually slows down. Um, and actually, that can, um, it can happen that you do cut off things that are essential for survival because one of the things they've noticed if people go through a really rapid weight loss and they're not getting enough protein your body will start breaking down even heart muscle yeah and that can be a problem and actually um since you mentioned the starvation when they set the rdas for protein it was based on preventing starvation in sub-saharan africa it wasn't based on um, people who are not as physically active and eating um, a more sufficient diet. So the protein RDA is a lot lower than it actually needs to be. And they recommend now that most people should probably have about, this is getting, I'm, I know I'm getting into dietitian talk, but instead of 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, it should be up around one2 or if people are physically active and as they get older, it could go up to 1.6. So yeah. it's a fair amount um, higher than what we were recommending in the 90s. And, and to put that in pounds, roughly what I would say is you're, you're going to need, need to eat somewhere between half, half a gram of protein per pound of body weight and maybe just a little, little higher than that. That's about the same range when you, you talk right. about kilograms. Yeah, the minimum that they had from the old guidelines was around um, four an average woman, it would be about 65 grams per day. Now, first of all, I will say people don't eat grams of protein. They <laughs> eat real food. Yes. So I tend not to emphasize the components of the food and really talk about getting a balanced diet because when you sit down to eat, you want to enjoy it. You don't want to be having to think about all these other components in the background. But if you get in the habit of having a variety of foods, you're automatically going to be getting the right stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's your body's pretty, pretty good about that. Once you sit down and you start putting your food together and you realize, okay, I'm going to need a protein source, a serving of fish or serving of chicken uh, is, going to, is going to roughly give you about you know, 25 to 30 grams. So if you're heating that about three times a day and maybe having a little bit of protein with your snacks and so like cheese or... Have some or yogurt like or cheese. Yeah. Then you're going to be hard boiled you're get, egg for breakfast. Yeah. So thinking um, through that you're getting protein with each meal is going to help. It's going to help with the satiation, not being afraid of olive oil because it's, it's not, it's not the bad fats for you. It's, it's actually very, very good for you. If you're getting a good quality, actual olive oil, cause I, I hate reading those stories where they go into grocery stores and test what's on the shelves and find that a, a large portion of it doesn't even actually have olive oil in it. <laughs> and I just, now that is just, pretty scary. Yeah, I just shake my head. It's like, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> right. But, so, okay. Uh, one, one that I, I found very interesting and, and because I, I just recently had another guest on and, he, you know, he's a big fan of, of smoothies. And so I tried his smoothie recipe and it's actually pretty good. I made some adjustments to it and tweaked it a little bit here and there. And what I th saw was, okay, this is, a, this is a great way for me to get in a full five ounces greens, uh, which would be difficult with just sitting down and eating them like, uh, like a salad. I, I had some spirulina and chlorella in there. Uh, so I'm getting even more greens, some celery or cucumber, something like that to, to bulk it up a little bit more and, and get, you know, some, cause there's more fluid there now, but in your myths, and it's, I really got to ask you this, does the blender actually break down the fiber 
in the plants to a point where you're not getting the benefit of that fiber? Yes. I'm, again, I'll apologize for getting maybe a little bit too chemically oriented, but the molecular weight of the um, fiber is really essential to allowing it to do its job. And along with pulverizing the vegetables, it actually does, especially the longer you go, it actually does cut up those fiber molecules and make them so that they're much less effective. And I will also say it's a really great thing, a great property of vegetables and fruits that they are bulky and filling and that it is hard to overeat when you get a lot of them in your diet. That's a benefit. And that's one of the things we're kind of messing uh, when we go towards the um, smoothies and so forth. We're missing the whole point. And one of the things I've really focused on with this book is reteaching people how to eat. And you might be thinking, okay, I know how to eat. I know how to put things in my my mouth. And uh, yeah, I, I don't mess up that often. <laughs> but it's that balance between having some foods that are bulky and filling and relatively low calorie, like the vegetables and like whole fruits. And then having along with that, something with some protein, something with some heart healthy fats, because those give you that satiety that allows you to stay full longer. Bulky filling to get filled up, and then the protein and the fat to feel full longer. And that helps people with avoiding overeating without their having to think about it. And I do agree with that. When If I sit down and I have something that has the, you know, like I said, a salad, and, and I'm usually pretty basic with my salads. You know, I might chop up a boiled egg and, uh, you know, the rest of it's and, and some olives on there, uh, and then I'll make, make my own vinaigrette and that's it. Or I'll do a can, uh, can of tuna or something like that on a salad. So it's fairly basic foods the way that I eat salads. But yeah, they, they fill me up and I actually... I, I could still take that same five ounces. It's just, it's really tough to get it all, get it all in. What I found with the smoothie was, was just the convenience of I can sip on this over the course of an hour or so while I'm working. And it's just, you know, it's, it's portable. So that was the other. On advantage. the other hand, then you never know when you've had enough. And that's one of the things that people who say, oh, I'm a grazer. I like to graze. And, but you have to stop and think, how do you know when you're done? If you're always continually eating, how do you know how much you've actually consumed? Whereas if you sit down and have a snack, and let's say you have an apple and you have a yogurt and maybe some nuts, you're going to um, finish that up and you're going to feel satisfied for a long time. So that's kind of um, a way of making it really easy to stay with your goals of getting the right foods. And those happen to be things that are all on the DASH diet, all on the Mediterranean diet. So you're automatically eating the right things. Okay. Now you had another one in here that uh, kind of shocked me a little bit because I, you know, it kind of goes contra to what I, I think most of the advice out there is. And that was that small changes are best. Yeah, that's always been the um, philosophy for, I would say almost 30 years, but people get discouraged so easily. Sometimes making a big change can make it much easier to sustain. And actually that's one of the reasons that we have the um, jumpstart portion of the um, plan in this book, because we want people to refocus on how they eat. And that is one thing I keep hearing over and over again from my online groups. People say, I'm not hungry, or I don't know how I can fit in all of this food. Whoever heard of a diet plan that you're saying, oh my gosh, I've got too much to eat here. So that really can be a big help in getting people going. And when they start to see that their blood pressure goes down right away, that they're starting to lose weight around their waist, and all of a sudden their clothes fit much better, that's reinforcement to keep going. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of one of the cores of this is, is, and that's where it kind of hit me was we tell people just take a small step. It's better than nothing. You know, it's like, if you can, you know, if you want to start a walking program, you know, maybe you're doing five minutes the first day and that's, that's all you can handle. You know, that's, that's a step. And then you're going to do a little bit more. Right, but, exactly. but what you're saying is particularly as we start looking at, at food, it's a, let's, let's do something drastic. So we see that payback and we're, we're reinforced fairly early. 
and we don't have those drag on effects of things because uh, we just finished up a sugar challenge as this episode's going live for the, just to deal with the differences of people. I've always had three levels in that. So one is, um, and I know these numbers are going to scare you, but one of them is just cut your sugar to 50 grams per day. And for some people, that's that's dr- already drastic enough. And then I have a, a, a 30 gram level, which is the intermediate, and then a 20 gram, which is the the advanced. And so I say, okay, we're just going to get our bodies to be able to understand and taste the sweetness of foods already. I remember as a kid, uh, we would get strawberries and we would put extra sugar on the strawberries. Yes. And, and, and today I can't, yes. I can't even fathom doing that. Not because I think that, you know, sugar is inherently evil. I just, when I eat a strawberry, it's about as sweet as I can take. I really don't want to add anything to sweeten the strawberry because it's already perfect. Exactly. And that, and that was something that was completely common. And now you can't understand at all why they would do that. And actually, I will say one of the things with sugar that comes from whole fruit is that you're going to absorb that more slowly because you do have the fiber and the cells and so forth. And they kind of hold trap things and help it digest a little bit slower. So having the whole fruits doesn't give you the same impact as having a Snickers bar, for example. Yeah. You it may see, you may see sugar. So you'll go online and you'll look up the sugar in that and say, okay, well, what, well I'd be better off eating the Snickers bar than I, I would be eating this fruit. And that's, that's not actually true. You actually would yeah, get more absolutely. Nutrients, uh, phytonutrients. It's going to stay with you longer if you have the whole fruit. Yeah. There's still a lot to be said about you are what you eat because your body's remaking your cells uh, all the time. And, and food's affecting how your genes are are expressed. So you, you really, there, there's so much in your food that uh, you, do you really want Snickers to be the one giving those signals and <laughs> materials? It doesn't mean you should never have something like <laughs> no, it, that. Because it doesn't. It you doesn't. still have to have a real life. But, you, you do. You do. And so, yeah. There are many you know. ways to satisfy that sweet tooth. And in fact, if you keep the right foods on hand, if you've got your refrigerator full of fruits and vegetables and so, so forth, you may think when you're getting up to get a snack, oh, maybe I would like to have the, um, a candy bar or something. But then you go open the refrigerator and you see some whole fruit and you see some, you know, some raw vegetables. You're thinking, oh, I could do that instead. I could have this yogurt. So that really makes it super easy to stay on hand when you keep the right foods on hand. Absolutely. Now, um, there was something else you put in the book. I don't, I don't want to talk about this a little bit. I, I didn't really so much put it on the plan, but it was it was kind of in, in my thought process as I was going through this because we've talked about yogurt a lot. And I know, you know, you walk into the grocery store and the, the low-fat yogurt or zero-fat yogurt, you know, they typically add sugar to it to, to sweeten it up or make it taste good enough, again, for, for someone to want to eat it. But you said something in the book that, that not all of that sugar is um, digestible or available because of the bacteria. Can you kind of talk through that process? Because I, really I really didn't absorb it the way I wanted to. Okay. <laughs> when you take milk to make yogurt, they have bacteria in there that help to um, digest the lactose. You know, lactose is the milk sugar. So it it helps to digest that and it breaks it down and it turns it into lactic acid, which is what gives you that tang when you're eating the the yogurt. It's the same thing also happens during manufacturing cheese. So when you look at a food label of yogurt, it will still include, it still shows the type of, the amount of sugar that was in the original milk. Now, that gets really confusing because it really isn't sugar anymore. However, they are changing the food labels. So now they will show you how much is added sugar. And it's not all sugar that you want to avoid. Like I said, with the fruits, you still want that in whole whole fruits. But if you can look at the yogurt on one of the newer food labels and see, okay, regular milk would have 15 grams of sugar. And this one has... Uh, 23 grams of sugar, and it shows me that eight grams are added sugar. That makes it a lot easier to understand. Yeah. And again, with the yogurt, you really it's really confusing because they make the manufacturers say that it's sugar, even though it isn't anymore. 
So you just kind of have to go on faith and just try to choose one that has low added sugar. Okay. Now, in the book, uh, you do give plans, you know, so someone's really concerned about just not knowing what to eat uh, because it's, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of variety here of what you can eat. And I, I like that's part of the focus of this, this whole thing is what you can eat. But you do go through a period of what you call the jump start, but you make that optional. Can you kind of explain what the jump start's about, why it's optional, and, um, and then how, how that would fit in then to the ongoing plan after that? Because this is not just a diet. This is, this is really a lifestyle. Yes. Um, one of the things that happens in most people's daily lives is they go from, they have a breakfast or something, and then their blood sugar crashes, and then they're hungry again. And you kind of get on this sugar roller coaster. And I will also say that starch breaks down to sugar as well. So it's not just raw sugar or something that makes a difference. It's also how much starchy foods you're eating that cause that blood sugar to surge and then to crash. So during the first week or two, you can do this jumpstart program that gets you off the sugar roller coaster. And it also teaches you to eat in a way that is filling and satisfying by really focusing in on the vegetables, um, learning how having some protein along with the bulky filling foods helps to keep you feeling satisfied longer. And that's what people say when they start going through this after a few days. It, you know what? I'm not as hungry and I'm just not eating as much of my meals as I used to. So it is a natural way of keeping your um, blood sugar on a more even keel and keeping your energy level more consistent throughout the day. So people can do that. And then that becomes the foundation when you start adding back in the fruits, um, some whole grains things like that, because you know you've already learned how satisfying it can be when you combine those healthy foods. Yeah, and, I, and I, as I looked at this, because you were, I guess basically we're dropping, we're dropping the fruit, or at least substantially and reducing the grains. And the grains. Um, and then and dairy. The was that, and was the dairy. non-fermented dairy. Uh, okay, non-fermented dairy. So, so you're, you're making some pretty big cuts there some eliminations for this first little period uh and it is going to be not not the funnest eating opportunity you're going to have to get a little creative which is really cool because the book also comes with recipes and so think about it as one day at a time or one hour at a time i can do this for this next period of time i can keep going just in little bitty steps because you are relearning how to eat and this is going to be the benefit for the rest of your life Absolutely. And so then after you've been on this for a while, then you can, you can start adding in, adding in some grains, uh, adding in some fruit, and that's going to give you, it's going to give you some great information. Uh, anytime you do an elimination diet like this, and then you add those foods back in systematically, you're able to see how well your body uses that for fuel uses that for building materials. And if, if, if you have any sensitivities to dairy, you're, you're going to notice it. If you have any sensitivities to sugar, uh, you're going to sense it. And if you have any issues with grains, you know, be it uh, gluten or whatever, you're, you're going to figure that out when you go through a process like this. A lot of people tell me that when they're going through this jump start phase, that their heartburn disappeared, they didn't feel as bloated, So there may be, as you say, food sensitivities that people are eliminating that were causing them to not feel as good. That also makes this something that you want to keep doing because you want to feel good. And and sometimes that's the wine. Wine can cause uh, the acid reflux and and that kind of heartburn kind of feeling. So, and that's also another thing that's not in the jumpstart is is there's no wine for that first little bit. But um, but then you put this... If you have some wine, it can also reduce your inhibition. So you're thinking, well, maybe I'm going to start eating sugar. You know, let's make some chocolate chip cookies. (laughs) 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 Yeah, no, it's it's, so. Like I said, you know, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of go through and and get a better feel for what these diets are and and where they can add value. I also appreciate when they're put together and they kind of give you a comprehensive program because both of them are kind of number one, tend to be number one and number two 
in the health studies that are out there of, of best diets. You know, they, they you know, kind of do the polls of, of what's out there and what the science is showing. Uh, it always kind of comes down. That th- those guys are always on the top of those tops of the lists. Absolutely. And it is because they are fundamentally good and they're something that people can follow for a lifetime to stay healthy. And that is something we all want to live a long time, but we also want to be healthy that whole time. We don't want to um, start losing our ability to do all of the things that we want to at a relatively young age. I agree. And, and, and food is a big, big part of that. So getting, getting your food right is, is really kind of the first step in, in regaining on, and maintaining your health. Uh, Marla, Absolutely. Marla, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? One of the first things is to um, ensure as you get older that you're having a little bit more protein in your diet because that is something that helps your body maintain muscle. And the more muscle you maintain as you get older, the better you feel. And it um, helps to prevent disabilities and so forth. It keeps people, if you can do the things that you want to do and feel like your body is young, then you're going to be happier. It's um, a lot of times it's these disabilities that really grind on people, whether it's something where they have like a pain syndrome or just a bunch of chronic health problems, that can be a problem. And one thing we didn't really talk about through this is this um, situation called metabolic syndrome, where people tend to gain more weight around the waist. They may have high triglycerides and low HDL, which is a good cholesterol, their blood pressure may be higher than they would like it to be, and they might not respond as well to insulin as they used to. So their blood sugar may be more on that roller coaster kind of thing. And all of these diseases go together, and they increase your risk for heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. All of those are challenging to deal with through your life. So if you're choosing a diet plan that helps to naturally lower your blood pressure, naturally help you with not having your blood sugar be as high, helps you with keeping your good cholesterol at a good level. Those are all things that are going to make you feel better and help you have a better quality of life for the rest of your life. Well, good, good. Well, Marla, thank you so much for that. The book is The Dash Diet Mediterranean Solution. If someone wanted to learn more about you or the book uh, and get the book, where would you like for me to send them? The website is dashdiet.org, O-R-G. Okay. So that will take them to the site and they can learn about it. We also have a group, uh, the Facebook page that is also Dash Diet. And we have some support groups for people who are trying to follow the the diets, and it helps some people have all kinds of great ideas. They have questions and so forth. So um, the Facebook groups for, um, I think one is Dash Diet 2, the number two, and the other one for the Mediterranean diet is Med Dash Diet, M-E-D Dash D-A-S-H Diet. Okay. So those are all good ways to Okay. Well, you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 371, and I'll be sure to have the links there. So Marla, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Okay. I really appreciated having the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode and that you took something valuable from it. I work hard to try to bring the best possible guests to the show. Uh, Typically, uh, that's me reaching out to them. Occasionally, publicists will also reach out to me, uh, but it does take some time to get them scheduled and get them on the show and make sure that we're giving you the best possible content that I can from their book and from what their thoughts are. Uh, And I do hope that you're getting some value out of of each and every episode, uh, because I do put a good bit of time into making sure that happens for you. And if you are, I am just going to ask you for one thing. 
would you become a Patreon for the show? Uh, it, it's not very expensive. It can be a dollar a month. I, I don't care. It's just, I, I, I'd love to have your support. There are support levels on the Patreon page. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash Patreon, and that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And by going to that page, you'll be able to make a, a monthly donation. Uh, if you make a $4 donation, I do acknowledge you. Uh, that's pretty much a buck a show. If you think the show is worth a dollar, uh, please, please, please do go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash Patreon so you can support the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast. Thank you. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Lisa Davis and discuss her book, Clean Eating, Dirty Sex. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.